Thank you for watching NTD Business coming up. The Supreme Court hears arguments on Biden's student loan forgiveness program. A number of conservative justices seem in favor of sinking the program. How big of a chance does it have? President Biden nominating a new labor secretary before the current one steps down next month. The Biden administration is giving semiconductor chip makers $40 billion in subsidies, but applicants have to participate in Democrat policy objectives. Microsoft updating Windows 11, putting its new AI-powered Bing front and center on the taskbar. A report claims that rich crypto whales ran away with retail traders' money during the 2022 crypto crash. We look into the report and speak with a skeptical expert. That and much more coming up on NTD Business. Good to have you with us. Don Ma here. The White House said today President Biden will nominate Julie Su to be the next labor secretary. Su has been the labor deputy secretary since 2021. Before that, she led the California Labor and Workforce Development Agency. In a statement, President Biden called Su a, quote, tested and experienced leader. She would replace Marty Walsh. He's stepping down next month to take over as the executive director of the National Hockey League Players Association. Sue's nomination could be contentious. In 2021, she was confirmed as the number two at the Labor Department without any Republican support. The U.S. Supreme Court hears arguments today on the Biden administration's plan to cancel $430 billion in student debt. Conservative justices expressed some doubt over the legality of this plan. U.S. Solicitor General Elizabeth Preloger argued on behalf of the plan. She faced skeptical questions from justices, including John Roberts, Samuel Alito, Clarence Thomas, and Brett Kavanaugh. One of the key issues is whether the Biden administration has the power to cancel the debt. Chief Justice John Roberts questioned why that wouldn't be a job for Congress. Most casual observers would say if you're going to give up that much amount of money, if you're going to affect the obligations of that many Americans on a subject that's of great controversy, they would think that's something for Congress to act on. And if they haven't acted on it, then maybe that's a good lesson to say for the uh, uh, president or or the um, uh, administrative bureaucracy that maybe that's not something they should undertake on their own. President Biden introduced the plan in August 2022. Under the plan, the U.S. government will forgive up to $10,000 in federal student debt for Americans making under $125,000 and $20,000 for recipients of Pell Grants to students from lower income families. During the oral arguments, Justice Neil Gorsuch said that student loan relief would be unfair to taxpayers who had no loans or who have already paid off their loans. In terms of fairness, for example, people who've paid their loans, people who um, don't ha- ha- have planned their lives around not seeking loans, um, and people who are not eligible for loans in the first place, and that a half a trillion dollars is being diverted to one group of favored persons over others. I think that's the nature of their argument. The court has a 6-3 to conservative majority. Biden's only hope for being allowed to move forward with his plan is if the court finds those challenging the plan don't have the right to do so. Biden wrote on Twitter, the relief is critical to over 40 million Americans. He's confident it's legal. Hundreds of demonstrators, including borrowers, rallied behind Biden's relief plan outside the court. So we can stand here to show the justice of the Supreme Court that we need relief and we need relief now. And we need to let them know again that today is a great day to cancel student debt. And we will not be subdued because of some sham lawsuits and partisan politics. We as the American people deserve this student debt cancellation. About 26 million Americans have applied for student loan forgiveness since August, and the U.S. Department of Education has already approved requests from 16 million. The court's rulings on the matter are due by the end of June. Joining me now is Jack Fitzhenry, Senior Legal Policy Analyst at the Heritage Foundation. Now, Jack, a big point that was debated about today in in the oral arguments was whether this this was an appropriate use of the HEROES Act. Now, both sides, I think, made some good points, but what's your take? Uh, Is it appropriate? The short answer is no, I don't believe this is appropriate. I believe the, the Biden administration has 
a sort of uh, colorable semantic argument for why the words of the HEROES Act could be interpreted broadly enough to allow them to cancel debt, uh, that doesn't mean that they ought to be interpreted in that manner in this circumstance. What we have here is an action of enormous political and economic consequence. It's uh, the type of programmatic relief for a huge swath of the population that is better entrusted to our elected representatives in Congress, in large part because Congress has the freedom and the ability to weigh the various trade-offs that inevitably go into implementing a program like this. The Secretary of State doesn't. The, or sorry, the Secretary of Education doesn't. Uh, Secretary of Education Cardona basically just considers the interests of student loan borrowers. He doesn't consider the interests of taxpayers, of student loan borrowers who may have already paid their loans. Uh, you know, this is just so enormously expensive, it affects lots and lots of people whose interests uh, Secretary Cardona just hasn't considered. So I, I don't think this is an appropriate use of the HEROES Act. So Jack, was it the intent of Congress to give the Secretary of Education to cancel student loans in mass in the e event of an emergency? Uh, it seems quite unlikely. Of course, we have to put ourselves in the, the shoes of the 2003 Congress that enacted this statute. It was, it was a response, of course, to uh, the 9-11 attacks, the war on terror, us having to send servicemen and women abroad uh, who might also be student loan borrowers. Um, and yes, there was language included by Congress in the HEROES Act that allowed it to apply more broadly than just to servicemen and women, right? When we have a national emergency, it can apply to directly affected individuals. Now, directly affected individuals is a term that Congress bothered to define in the HEROES Act. And it said those who had direct effects from the national emergency that made them relatively worse off, specifically with respect to their student loans. Um, so the idea that the 2003 Congress imagined this power would be invoked to cancel loans for millions of borrowers who have not been financially affected, who haven't been made worse off with respect to their student loans. I think that's an implausible assertion. It's not a, um, it's certainly not a restrained reading of the statutory text. A justice was saying they don't really allow one person to step into another person's shoes. So can the state of Missouri sue on behalf of Mohila, Missouri Higher Education Loan Authority? So this concerns whether or not the state of Missouri even has the right to bring the argument. So it's separate from the question of whether or not Secretary Cardone has the authority to cancel debt. But it's a question about who has the right to bring a challenge to the secretary's action. Um, it's true that the court typically does not allow third parties to go and assert the rights of somebody else. But here we have to look at the relationship between the parties. Mohila, which is a student loan servicer, was created by the state of Missouri to serve a government purpose. It remains under government control. It is, as the sec uh, Solicitor General conceded during oral argument, an instrumentality of the state of Missouri. There is a nominal distinction between the two. Uh, but in fact, their interests are very much united. I would be surprised if the court found that Missouri did not have standing to be there and assert arguments on behalf of Mahila. Thank you very much for coming on today, Jack. Pleasure speaking to you. Thank you. The Congressional Budget Office said the plan could cost about $400 billion. But the Warden School estimates the price tag could blow past $1 trillion. An update to Microsoft Windows 11. It's putting its new AI-powered Bing front and center on its taskbar. It's the latest sign the company is doubling down on AI technology, despite some controversy over it. Microsoft says the taskbar has more than half a billion users every month, making it a good spot to eventually expose more users to the new feature. The company unveiled its AI-powered chatbot for Bing earlier this month as it aims to compete with Google and other tech companies. Microsoft has been gathering feedback on the new Bing before a wider rollout. The company is examining how to root out potential unintended and inappropriate responses. On to Wall Street, stocks closed lower today and all three major indexes ended with monthly declines. The Dow fell 232 points or 0.7 percent, S&P lost 12 points or 0.3 percent, NASDAQ dropped 11 points or 0.1 percent. A new report claims so-called cryptocurrency whales ate small-time retail traders alive during the 2022 Bitcoin crash. What does that mean? Here's NTD Char Marshall. Did crypto whales eat retail traders in 2022? 
Coinbase and FTX activity jumped after news broke about the troubles of Terra and FTX. Patterns suggest that users tried to weather the storm by adjusting their portfolios. But in stormy seas, the whales eat the krill. This analogy is used in a study by BIS, or Bank for International Settlements, investigating crypto trading patterns. Whales being those with more than 1,000 Bitcoin, and Krill being the mom and pop small time traders who lost their money in the crypto crash. As prices tumbled, all users traded more, but whales sold while Krill bought. In the report, eating up some, you know, algae or however they phrase it, right? This, this is a metaphor that they're using to try to scare people rather than talk about the facts they're making an emotional plea with that wording. Thomas Hogan is on the senior research faculty at AIER. He was formerly the chief economist for the U.S. Senate Committee on Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs. He's not so quick to take the report for face value. The Bank of International Settlements is a group of central banks and, and banking systems, and so they're competitors of the crypto industry, right? And so, you know, if it were McDonald's accusing Burger King of doing something, we wouldn't just take them at their word. We would want to look at the evidence. Hogan believes there should be less, not more, regulation in crypto, but notes there have been incidents that have caused problems. Uh, but there can be cases where those players have a lot of power and try to actively manipulate the financial markets. And that actually does seem to be something that was the case in the specific e example of the collapse of Terra, um, because there was one big player that we just recently found out, um, Jump Crypto was actively playing in that market and made about more than a billion dollars from the collapse of the Terra token. In 2022, Bitcoin fell more than 64% from 47,300 to 16,500, according to data compiled by Bloomberg. Sean Marshall, NTD News. Tesla is set to build a new plant in northern Mexico. This is from the country's president today. The plant will be Tesla's third outside the U.S. The Mexican president told reporters this will represent a considerable investment and many jobs. The initial investment will be around $1 billion. According to a Mexican source with knowledge of the matter, the amount invested over the entire project could be as much as $10 billion. Tesla will hold its investor day tomorrow. CEO Elon Musk could give more details about the Mexico plant then. Tesla is also expected to give details of a new cheaper model of vehicle at the event. Elon Musk is once again the richest person in the world, according to Bloomberg's tally. Musk's wealth was boosted by a nearly 70% surge in Tesla stock price this year. In today's special report, we look at the nation's first major industrial policy move in decades. The Biden administration has launched the first Chips for America subsidy program. He's giving semiconductor chip makers $40 billion in taxpayer subsidies. The administration says it wants to restore U.S. leadership in semiconductor manufacturing. America used to be the world's dominant semiconductor maker. In fact, America invented the semiconductor. But that dominance eroded over time. Other countries got into the industry. Costs went up. Talent was hard to find. Now America only makes 10% of the world's semiconductors. Semiconductor chips are tiny pieces of silicon that are the brains of many electronic devices. Without them, we wouldn't have things like computers, of course, phones, spacecraft, even probably the Internet. A strong semiconductor industry can bring significant economic, technological, and strategic benefits to a country. So it's clearly in the Biden administration's interest to give the chip industry a boost. Companies will have to meet a number of requirements in this subsidy program if they want to receive the taxpayer money. Here's the thing. Many of these requirements advance liberal policies and ideals. For example, applicants who promise not to buy back stock will be given preference over others. Under certain conditions, companies must share excess profits with the government. Companies who want $150 million or more must guarantee affordable, high-quality child care for workers who build or operate a plant. This is to allow more women to enter the industry. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo says chip makers won't be successful unless they're hiring more women. And a lack of access to child care is one key barrier to hiring more. And we spoke to senior researcher Ryan Yonk from the American Institute for Economic Research. He favors companies choosing whether or not to do these things based on if it makes sense for their profitability. He thinks having to follow these government requirements, though, is problematic. 
The evidence is really mixed about whether or not government mandates like this actually increase representation in the workforce. There's some evidence that suggests it does saw a little bit. There's other evidence that suggests it's temporary. And as a result, uh, the best programs are those where the benefit is aligned with um, the goals, both of the employees and the employer, and not, again, as I said, not um, the political whims of an administration looking to curry favor in an upcoming ele election. We spoke to economist Vance Ginn, the president of Ginn Economic Consulting, to get his take on Biden's $40 billion subsidies. He says the government is basically using taxpayer money to prop up a certain industry. He believes this is a bad deal for Americans. It should not be driven by government mandates, by a top-down approach. That's really socialism. This is not a free market capitalistic sort of approach that has made us so prosperous over time. We should make sure that we have the best business environment possible, the lowest cost of doing business here in America. That means lowering the corporate, in, uh, corporate tax rate, um, making sure regulations are not stifling economic growth and opportunity here in the United States for job creation, for chips to be manufactured here. We also got arguments in favor of Biden's semiconductor subsidies. We talked to the president of the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation, Robert Atkinson. His foundation focuses on industry, which, of course, includes the semiconductor industry. This is a unique industry in the sense that it's heavily fought over by countries. Many, many countries want a fab or a semiconductor industry in their country, and they're willing to put a lot of money into this. And the uh, costs of building a fab are in the billions and billions of dollars. And so the subsidies for this program, they're not long-term subsidies to prop up inefficient companies. They're simply saying, if you build a fab, we're going to give you some of the money to offset the high capital expenditure costs. Atkinson says other countries like China, Taiwan, South Korea, and Japan have been subsidizing their chip industries for years. And the U.S. has never done so. The U.S. currently relies on these East Asian countries for 75 percent of the world's chips. Atkinson also says companies should be able to compete effectively on their own after receiving only one round of subsidies. He says this first round is crucial. There's no way a, ta a general tax program can do that. There's no way deregulation can do that. Uh, the reason why the U.S. lost went from 40 percent of semiconductor production in the 70s to around 12 percent today didn't really have anything to do with our tax code or our regulatory system. They were minor, minor irritants at best. It was really about the cost of building and constructing and operating a fab. So I think these incentives are essential. Chips for America is now seeking applications for these subsidies. If you have any questions about Chips for America, contact askchips at chips.gov. The chairman of the House Select Committee on China is raising another concern about TikTok. Congressman Mike Gallagher told NTD it's not just about the CCP accessing American user data. He says TikTok's algorithm could also be a problem because it can manipulate what Americans see on the platform. The real concern is giving ByteDance and by extension the CCP the ability to control the news, to control information flows, because TikTok's on the cusp of becoming the most influential media platform in the United States. And I'm not sure we want to allow a company that has that relationship with the Chinese Communist Party to be that powerful in terms of deciding what information we have access to. Gallagher introduced a bill that would either ban TikTok or force its Chinese parent company ByteDance to sell TikTok to a U.S. company. And House Republicans are expected to move forward today with a bill that would give Biden the power to ban TikTok nationwide. Virginia is moving to ban foreign adversaries, namely Communist China, from buying farmland. Many lawmakers in recent years have expressed concerns that such purchases would undermine U.S. national security. NTD's Colin Fredrickson reports. Lawmakers in the Virginia House of Delegates and Senate recently approved a bill that bans foreign adversaries, including China, from buying farmland in the Commonwealth. Republican Governor Glenn Youngkin is expected to sign this bill. He discussed the problem in his State of the Commonwealth address in January. While the national security concerns and personal privacy implications of CCP technology are well known, I believe Virginians also should be wary of Chinese communist intrusion into Virginia's economy. 
Virginia's list of foreign adversaries includes communist China, Cuba, Russia, North Korea, and a Venezuelan politician. The bill also requires Virginia's Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services to publish an annual report of foreign land ownership to the governor and general assembly. Virginians, not the CCP, should own the rich and vibrant agricultural lands God has blessed us with. That is why I'm asking this general assembly to send me a bill to prohibit dangerous foreign entities tied to the CCP from purchasing Virginia's farmland. According to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Chinese entities owned about 14,000 acres of farmland in Virginia as of the end of 2021. Most of that is tied to the 2013 purchase of Smithfield Foods, the largest pork producer in the U.S. The ban would be retroactively effective from January 1st. The new House China Select Committee will hold its first hearing tonight at 7 o'clock. It's going to focus on the Chinese Communist Party's threat to America. You can watch it on the NTD YouTube channel. If you've ever wanted to be an air marshal, now could be your chance. The TSA is looking to hire over 400 new recruits for the position. A hiring drive was held in New Jersey yesterday. NTD's Jeremy Sandberg has more on the recruitment effort. We are the last line of defense. We want to make sure that we get the very best of the best. A recruitment event for new air marshals was held at Newark Liberty International Airport on Monday. After 9-11, we had a large group of people who found a calling with the Federal Air Marshal Service, and they are all due to retire. So we are in need of hiring. Candidates need to have excellent eyesight and handgun sharpshooting skills. That's to be able to effectively respond to threats in the confined space of an airplane full of people. Air marshals must also be adept at blending in. As a federal air marshal, you're, you work undercover, and it's really important to remain undercover, and that's why we're quiet and discreet. Several hundred people applied for the positions on Monday. For me personally, the biggest thing is just uh, being able to give back and serve my country um, in some capacity. Travel, see the world, take one day at a time, like, um, and protect and serve. The TSA has several more recruitment events scheduled in different cities through the end of the year. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. Many young children leave behind their baby teeth beneath their pillows expecting to wake up with cash. Delta Dental's 2023 original tooth fairy poll found that a single lost tooth brings in an average of $6. That's a 16% increase from about 5 bucks at the beginning of last year. The $6 figure is also the highest in the poll's 25-year history. When the poll first started in 1998, the tooth fairy left an average of $1.30 under the pillow. That amount has surged 379% to $6.23 per tooth today. Delta Dental projects that the tooth fairy will have to leave an astounding $30 for a single tooth by 2048 for a kid. That's a lot of dough. And that's all today from the NTD business team and myself, Don Ma. You can follow me on Twitter if you're there. And if you have any news tips or feedback for the show, you can email us at business at NTD.com. Thank you for watching. I'll see you tomorrow.